We held the front line ahead until the following morning. The route of our withdrawal brought us once more to the ghastly place. Hanging from the wrecked trucks, limbs in crazy dislocation, were the dead. Arms and legs were strewn across the terrain, their bandages fluttering in the wind. In their panic, most of the wounded had attempted to drag themselves clear on all fours, but the majority lacked strength for the effort. Their wounds had reopened and they either bled to death or their circulatory system collapsed. The radius of the killing field, littered with corpses, extended 300 metres from the train wreck. The handful of medics and doctors had done what they could. Hope grew at our approach. A group of 50 German riflemen, half of them in need of proper medical attention themselves. The Russians were hot on our heels and would arrive within the hour. We helped by improvising stretchers and agreed on a cruel selection process, picking out those still able to walk or who had a realistic chance of surviving a stretcher journey. The remainder would be left behind. Twenty-four hours previously we had to some extent envied the wounded, since at least theoretically they had come through and were now headed for home. But now the war had seized them back, restored them to our ranks and given them the task of fighting for their lives should they wish to continue living. A pistol shot rang out. Instinctively all looked towards the report. A Jaeger, 08 in his hand, was standing over the body of one of the wounded. I strode over and asked the man, What the hell have you done? With a sob he sank to his knees, and it was a few minutes before he composed himself enough to reply. I looked at the body of his friend and neighbour, both legs amputated, the stumps ripped apart and bleeding, the upper torso riddled with steel splinters. It was incredible that he had survived so long with such injuries. The man knew he would be left behind to fall into Russian hands. When the two friends met, he had pleaded for a last act of friendship, a bullet to bring his suffering to an end. He implored so passionately that his friend fulfilled his request. This kind of thing was absolutely contrary to regulations. As we trudged away from the grim location, we hoped that the Russians, when they arrived, would care for the wounded, or at least put them swiftly out of their misery. It was an awful lot to expect. Often they tortured the wounded, and had there been no surgeons present, very possibly we would have performed a kindness for all the living we had to leave behind. I prepared my sniper's rifle and brought up the rear about 500 metres behind the main group. We had been no more than 30 minutes on the march when I became aware of a Russian assault troop not far behind. I concealed myself amongst undergrowth and rested the barrel of my rifle on the thick forked branch of a tree. My field of fire was obstructed by bushes which the Russians used skillfully for cover. Routine, intuition, and the feel for a situation inbred in the born hunter paid off in such situations. At 150 metres I identified the platoon leader, lined the cross wires of the telescopic sight at his chest, and watched his passage through the dense vegetation. The right moment came. For a second or so he was exposed between bushes. I squeezed the trigger and saw the impact of the projectile hurtle him backwards into the brush. His platoon was sufficiently astute to recognise the work of a sniper and sprayed out in all directions for cover. I got off two more rounds without definite result, although one hit a field flask and kept all of them low for the next half hour, gaining precious time for my retreating group. Once I rejoined them to report my success, a number of riflemen volunteered to protect the rear of our column with me, and to my surprise by evening we had remained undetected. During the night our path coincided with that of another Jaeger battalion. This provided us with a formation of respectable numbers, and we soon received a signal ordering us to dig in and stem the Russian advance for as long as possible. A sharpshooter whom I knew only by repute was Josef Roth, a Nuremberger of my own age who had volunteered for the Gebirgsjäger, and on his own initiative practised with a captured Russian rifle, as I had done, and found employment as a sniper. I sought him out from among the other battalion, and we got on handsomely from the start. The battalion commander knew how important it was to have snipers integrated into the defensive pattern, and allowed us a free hand. While the other riflemen dug trenches, Joseph and I carried out a joint reconnaissance of the terrain, and then settled down to work out our plan. 
we agreed that two experts working as a pair were better than marksmen operating singly. For three days the weather had been dry, with temperatures slightly above freezing. Towards eight next morning, a shot whipped into the trench diggers. A private soldier crumpled up, screaming. Like greased lightning, the others all threw themselves to the ground, bar one, who dithered a split second, debating whether he should help his fallen friend. He would never have heard the bullet which entered his skull behind the left ear and exited through the right eye, leaving a hole the size of a fist. Somebody yelled, Achtung, snipers! From their sentinel nests, the MG gunners poured streams of fire in the general direction of the presumed sniper, but without apparent effect. Joseph and I were still discussing our arrangements at battalion command when a breathless dispatch runner arrived to blurt out his report of events. The commander looked up. Well, Yaga, you know your duty, solve the problem. At a trot, keeping carefully to cover, we followed the runner to a recently finished stretch of trench where a sergeant elaborated the details. A shallow gallery led from one end of the trench into a skillfully concealed observation post amongst a clump of bushes. From this lookout position we scrutinised the terrain for all possible sniper hides, but failed to identify a spot even though we were suspicious of one particular region, because it matched the angle of fire at the end of which our two comrades had been felled. We kept a watch in vain for hours. Joseph said there was no position opposite that looked remotely ideal. At midday, while emptying a fruit tin of excrement over the trench parapet, a third Jaeger fell victim to the Russian marksman. He was somewhat luckier twice over than the other two, however, for the projectile was deflected from the rim of his steel helmet into his upper arm, where it opened a gaping wound only. Contrary to practice, the Russian had not used an explosive bullet. At that very moment, Joseph and I were observing the enemy front line through binoculars, we both noticed how the tall grass fronting a low undulation parted briefly under the pressure wave of the shot. We had to admire the ingenuity of our opponent in creating such a neat lair. He must have burrowed through the elevation from the back. The question was, did he have enough experience to abandon the position, or would he stay? The latter seemed more likely, since all three of our victims had been hit from roughly the same direction. We had to get him to show himself, and decided on the use of a lure. Joseph would take up a position about fifty metres along the trench while I remained in the observation post. We would aim and fire simultaneously at the spot where the grass moved. A scarecrow dressed in camouflage jacket and peaked field cap was prepared, and while sneaking to his position, Joseph handed the scarecrow to a rifleman halfway along with the instruction that in exactly ten minutes' time, it was to be raised cautiously until the field cap was visible above the parapet. Our two rifles were focused on the presumed hide of the Russian sniper, waiting for the scarecrow to make his debut. When it rose, the Soviet made his fatal error. He was overconfident, and that was what killed him. Clearly he had already dismissed from his mind the idea of a lure, and was therefore not even certain of his target when he fired from an unchanged position, Hardly had his shot rang out than we replied, each using one of our precious captured explosive rounds. I watched the drama through the sight, a flurry of hectic activity and then something heavy being dragged away. A Soviet observer offered himself for death by standing up and surveying our lines through binoculars. Both bullets drilled into his head simultaneously, exploding it like an overripe pumpkin. His binoculars dropped to his chest undamaged. Now it was the turn of the Russians to cower in their dugouts, enabling our diggers to resume their excavations. Branching forward from our front line at various distances along its length were shallow communication trenches leading to a pair of MG nests. Yosef and I designed and dug six well-camouflaged hides, three each, the most forward locations being situated between each MG position. This allowed us to cover no man's land in such a way that no area was obscured from our field of fire. Our plan was to keep up a lethal crossfire until the advancing Russian infantry was at hundred metres, then change to shooting directly ahead. Further down each branch were two more rearward positions for the contingency that we were spotted. This strategy worked and was a major contributory factor towards the success of our battalion in holding off the Russian attack for two days 
during which time we evacuated our wounded, including the survivors from the ambulance train. The pressure on the Nikopol bridgehead was soon irresistible, and a new encirclement began to threaten. The merged battalions were parted in the general reorganization. Joseph and I shook hands and expressed the hope that we would meet in the future under happier circumstances. Our cooperation had proved that having a specialist observer alongside could be a decisive factor. Although after the death of Balduin Moser I had vowed to work alone, I saw that teamwork had definite advantages, a fact of which I managed to convince my company commander to the extent that he assented to my recruiting a veteran helper whenever I considered the opportunity favourable. Our two regiments began their bitter struggle to escape the Russian encircling manoeuvre. GJR 144 was assigned the role of mounting diversionary raids aimed at keeping open important crossroads to be used by our retreating forces. Our numbers severely reduced, it was close to miraculous that we kept the line intact and even launched the odd counter-attack to give a deceptive impression of our strength. We suffered grievous losses and the continued existence of our weakened regiment was never guaranteed for whole companies were wiped out to the last man. On 12 February 1944, after four days of bitter fighting, the order came down to evacuate the Nikopol bridgehead. By now our regiment had been so long without supplies that we lacked heavy infantry weapons altogether, and every rifleman had a maximum of ten rounds. Since we were under continuous pressure from the enemy the situation was extremely grave, and the few snipers were called upon to serve the role of the artillery. We were the last desperate line of defence, the last hope of holding the Soviets at a distance, and every man went to work gathering together all available Russian rifle ammunition. 3rd GD fought out of the encirclement after great effort and with heavy losses, and reached the new front line at Ingules. We were assisted by severe winter weather, ice and snowstorms, which made organised fighting impossible, but did nothing to alleviate our weakened state. In apathy we staggered across the flat steppe, ice crystals adhering to pinched features like needles. The Celsius thermometer read 50 below zero. Whoever stopped moving or fell in exhaustion had deadly frostbite within minutes. The hobnailed soles of our mountain boots were a conduit for the cold. If one had sweaty socks, often the skin would freeze to the boot, and then the wearer could only creep forward. The medics could do nothing to help because all liquid medications were frozen in their containers, although for the worst cases they always kept some morphine ampules available in their mouths. Wounds froze at once and became gangrenous. Fights broke out for possession of winter clothing found on stiff frozen Russian corpses, happy the man who emerged wealthier by a snow hat or fur boots. Remorselessly the battalion pressed on. On occasion when I stopped for a breather, I received encouragement to proceed by a kick in the rear or a prod with a rifle butt, and when necessary, I repaid the compliment. Many of our number died of the cold or total exhaustion, reducing ever lower our number of fighting fit. We dragged the wounded along with us so long as any individual retained a prospect of recovery, otherwise they were abandoned, together with the mules that could go no further, having long since consumed the last of their oats. Our ice-coated weapons were useless, the extreme cold contracted the steel to jam the breeches. The expensive precision work, which was the hallmark of the German weapons manufacturer, was now a curse. Russian weapons with their much greater tolerances functioned even in the lowest temperatures. Trench digging in the stone-hard ground was out of the question. Driven on by the instinct to survive, we dragged our way through the pitiless steppe as the snowstorm grew in intensity. Numb from hunger and exhaustion, I staggered through the knee-high snow, my sniper's rifle slung across my back and wrapped in a thick blanket for protection. Over my uniform I wore a padded camouflage jacket, the large hood covering my head and face. After a while there emerged through the impenetrable greyness of the storm the silhouette of a gutted farmhouse with a giant haystack alongside it. By now the cold was almost intolerable. As I turned towards it, the ground gave way. With a cry, I fell into an infantry trench. One of the occupants was still present, stiff as a board, a smile frozen across his features. 
Like a wild beetle, I scrambled on all fours to the surface. The farmhouse was only thirty metres distant. Suddenly movement was seen from within it, and we spread out quickly. My limbs were so cold that I could not unburden myself of the rifle. Various gyrations proved unsuccessful. We were defenceless. Scraps of Russian conversation were borne to us on the wind. Fearfully we awaited the bursts of MG fire that would spell our doom. Nothing happened. Minutes of terrible uncertainty ticked by until it was obvious. The Russians were snowbound and unable to fight. Both sides withdrew gingerly. Night came, and the storm grew fiercer. Getting under cover now meant the difference between life and death. We slunk towards the giant haystack, the only protection far and wide against the rage of nature. We had reached the point where nobody cared any more. Shelter was all that mattered. We ran the last few metres and burrowed deeply into the warming straw. Abandoning all rules of self-protection and security, we huddled together like piglets and so survived. During the two days and nights when it raged with unrestrained fury, we suspended hostilities, for the haystack was the only chance of survival for the Russians as well. Unable to fight, the respective bitter enemies agreed to share the stack, separated by a central demarcation line. The storm abated on the morning of 20th February 1944, by which time our weapons were again serviceable. Nervously we reconnoitred the giant haystack, feeling cautiously for the Russians. They had decided that discretion was the better part of valour, and vanished into the night. A three-man patrol, waist-high in snow, inspected the farmhouse for signs of life. They came back relieved, we had the farm to ourselves. Shortly afterwards we resumed our trudge across the endless, deathly still desert of snow towards the new strong point at Ingoles. We had not eaten for days and were close to collapse when we stumbled into a ruined village held by our troops from whom our regiment obtained ammunition, clothing, blankets and food. As I was attached to battalion staff, I wallowed in the luxury of superior accommodation, insofar as there was such a thing, equipped with an oven. I was dozing in a cosy corner when Houtman Kloss returned from a regimental briefing. Trembling with cold, he crouched before the roaring fire of the stove, then thrust his soaked boots close to the warmth. A pleasant feeling of relaxation must have crept over him, for he slumped back against the wall and was soon asleep. A short while later, when I happened to glance in his direction, I noticed smoke rising from his boots. Within a few moments he jumped up with a cry of, Shit, that's hot, and began to hop around the room. His efforts to pull off the boots, though assisted by a runner, were unsuccessful. The wet leather had dried too quickly in the heat, and shrinking had moulded to his feet. The only remedy was for Kloss to sit with the boots immersed in a bucket of cold water and wait for the leather to soften and expand. To wide grins from a large assembly, the crisis was eventually overcome. Later that day, a new uniform issue was announced, and Kloss was able to exchange his leather boots for a fur-lined pair. On 25th February 1944, the Russians attacked but were repulsed by the defensive barrage of a newly operational mountain artillery regiment. Meanwhile, the infantry fell back on Ingules, where the new front line had been established. As so often in the past, it had been bungled. While officers on the spot had planned correctly for the strategic and tactical situation, OKH intervened to order the holding of utterly superfluous positions at all costs. The result was more heavy losses in men and materials, neither of which were now capable of being made good, for logistically it was no longer possible to compensate the huge drain on resources on this front even though the lines of communication were regularly shrinking in length. The military operation degenerated into a chaotic struggle to retreat in which the watchword was Sauve qui peut. The line at Ingules was a catastrophe waiting to happen. Requests to shorten the line were refused, the essential reorganisation of forces waved brusquely aside. An overstretched and ragged front line awaited Russian attacks, which were ever more gigantic. Divisions and regiments with high morale and extensive experience, such as 3rd GD, carried the hopes of local commanders. Repeatedly thrown into the thick of the fray, 
On their shoulders alone often rested the responsibility of preventing a major breach of the line and the spectre of encirclement. They had no operational security, for whatever lay to the rear was improvised. The price was insufferable losses in men and materials. On 1st March 1944, great waves of Russian foot soldiers streamed towards the German lines. Their determination on this occasion was of especial note. 3rd GD shared the sector with 1st Panzer Grenadier Division, and along this stretch the Soviets made up their losses in personnel daily, with endless marching columns of men arriving from deep in the interior. They lost a thousand men per day, while our losses were nowhere near that figure. On the third day, the Panzer Grenadiers were wiped out, and we had to plug the gap on the flank. By the fourth day, 3rd GD had shrunk to half its starting numbers, 50% having fallen in the field or been wounded and unable to continue. Although right in the centre of the fighting, I received no more than a few scratches. Once more, high morale and experience proved for some time that it could compensate for what was sadly lacking in numbers, but by the end of the fifth day, my battalion was reduced to 60. While we had been holding at bay an enemy attacking along two sides of the wedge, the sound of violent combat swelled up to our rear, and simultaneously a radio operator received a signal from battalion headquarter that they were under heavy attack and were asking for help. An enemy unit had infiltrated behind our lines and was attempting to eradicate our command centre. Thirty defenders were outnumbered three to one. A violent engagement had begun, and the defenders were now low on ammunition. The battalion headquarter structure was not intended as a fortification, and casualties were already serious. The main Russian attack on the front line was concentrated further down, so that the company commander decided to chance weakening the sector by releasing a couple of men to support the defence of battalion headquarter. This was agreed with other company commanders, who also detached a few men each. Soon the necessary battle-proven platoon had been assembled, twenty of us in all, including myself and a specially chosen observer. The report from battalion headquarter had arrived at about eight in the morning. Barely an hour later the relief platoon set off to cover the intervening 1,500 metres as quickly as possible, but with due caution, and in a quarter of an hour established contact with the enemy. Battalion headquarter was set in a depression at the foot of an imposing hill, the terrain being in the main bushy upland. We did not have the strength to hold the hill, but for the Russians it was of strategic importance since from the peak they could overlook the German positions. The defenders had withdrawn to the last remaining fortification and were almost out of ammunition. In response to the withering fire of the Russians, they replied with the occasional rifle round. The area surrounding battalion headquarter was strewn with the dead of both sides. We halted briefly to take stock. With my observer I sought out some thick vegetation which appeared to offer excellent natural cover and a relatively good view of the proceedings. As the platoon settled in, waiting for the signal to attack, my observer sized up the Russian force. Through his binoculars, he had a very wide field of sight in comparison with that available to me through my telescopic sight, and this was bound to help me raise my score of kills significantly by precise indications of where to aim. I watched as an apparently dead German infantryman with a profusely bleeding head wound tried to push himself up with his hands and was immediately cut down by a burst of Russian MG fire. His head turned into a red mass under the rain of projectiles. Small wall of earth ten metres right, my observer muttered. Moving my rifle, I soon had the Russian in the sight, aimed at his chest, squeezed the trigger bang, dead. Perfect shot at 150 metres. This success was the signal to attack. The platoon opened fire. My own projectiles began to eat into the enemy numbers. The skirmish was short and violent. Caught in the unexpected crossfire of platoon and sniper, and horrified by their escalating losses, the Russians lost their heads. Shooting wildly in all directions, they withdrew in disorder. Twenty made it into the undergrowth. They left eighty dead and wounded behind. There was no time for anything more. After a short discussion with the battalion headquarter survivors, we headed once again for the front. Twenty minutes later we were in our own trenches. The battle raged for six days, almost without pause. 
Towards its conclusion, we were so exhausted that it was easy to fall into a coma-like sleep during the shortest period of inactivity. The medics made regular distributions of pervitin to keep us alert. 3rd GD held its positions until 7 March 1944, even though the Soviets crossed the Ingules River the previous day and dynamited parts of the front line. The division became a thorn in their side. To remove us, the usual infantry solution was adopted once more. GJR 144 was at the heart of this pressure. When it got too hot for us, we fell back on the regimental headquarter and fought there. The command structure had ceased to function. Each group fought for itself and to survive. During this utter confusion, the order came to retreat across the Ingules forthwith. This was easier said than done. The Russians had more or less succeeded in isolating 3rd GD. Its line of supply no longer existed and the main field hospital was in Soviet hands. All that remained was a defended corridor, about one kilometre in width, through which the retreat had to be funnelled. These were the circumstances under which the few fighting fit survivors and walking wounded of GJR 144 embarked upon their withdrawal, their numbers swollen from time to time by remnants from other units. Some of the latter included four medics who had fled the Russian assault on the main field hospital. The men were in a highly agitated state and appeared close to mental breakdown, a sign of some terrible experience. A sergeant who asked of them the whys and wherefores received such irrational garble in reply that he shrugged his shoulders in bemusement and passed them to the dressing station with orders that they should be given a meal and a shot of rum. This did the trick, and after a while they were sufficiently calm to be able to deliver an account of their chilling ordeal. We shrank in horror at what they had to tell us and heightened our will to resist Russian captivity. Not all the wounded had been allocated a berth on the ill-fated last ambulance train out of the partial encirclement. The hopeless cases had been left behind at the main field hospital under the care of a doctor and seven medics. In order to indicate that the area was hors de combat, it had been staked out with red cross and white flags, and all weapons placed in the open. It was a Mongolian unit that captured the field hospital. After moving warily from tent to tent, they surrounded the area and called upon the fascist swine inside to come out with their hands raised. The Mongols approached the medical staff nervously, weapons at the ready. Two medics emerged from the surgical operation tent. They had learnt off by heart a few sentences from a Russian phrase book for soldiers on the Eastern Front and said, We are unarmed. Here only wounded. We surrender to the Soviet army. Hands above the head. The two medics, trembling with fear, awaited the confrontation with the Asiatic soldiers. The first came up to them and issued an order that was not understood. Immediately the Mongol rammed the stock of his machine pistol into the face of the medic, breaking his nose. Blood coursed swiftly from between his fingers, which were covering the injury to his mouth. He collapsed to the ground. The Mongol took a step back and fired a burst from his weapon into the upper torso of the injured man. At that moment the surgeon, still wearing a blood-smeared apron, emerged from the operating tent together with an assistant to find out what was going on. Four other Russians arrived, attracted by the commotion, and forced the three Germans back into the operating tent at gunpoint, screaming a series of incomprehensible orders. On the operating table lay a soldier with severe head wounds, which were being bandaged by a fourth medic. One of the Russians pushed past, drew a knife from its scabbard on his belt, and drove it into the heart of the patient through his ribcage, turned it two or three times before withdrawal and made the observation, This fascist pig is no longer required. The Germans looked on with shock, realising full well what danger they now found themselves in. They were forced into an adjoining tent in which the other, seriously wounded, had been prepared for surgery. A Mongol sergeant pushed the surgeon aside as he pleaded with the Soviet to spare the wounded. The sergeant said, Now we will show you what happens to people who invade Mother Russia and kill women and children. With a gesture to a subordinate, he indicated to the wounded men and said, Cut their throats like sheep. Wherever these people came from, they must have been expert sheep farmers and slaughterers, 
for they drew knives, honed to a fine sharpness, from inside their boots and set about the task in hand with great dexterity. Without the least sign of emotion or excitement, they raised each head and made a deep incision across the throat. The Mongols worked swiftly and expertly, and in a few minutes the operating theatre had been transformed into a human slaughterhouse. The majority did not die instantly, but bled to death where they lay. The surgeon, who confronted every day the ugliness of war, blanched and collapsed to his knees. Weakling, the Mongol sergeant said, smashing the stock of his machine pistol in the surgeon's face, adding, You pig, suck my boots. He raised the weapon by the barrel and brought it down with full force on the German's skull. Three similar blows followed to ensure death. The medics were frozen in horror in one corner of the tent. The Mongol pulled one of them to him and wiped the blood-smeared butt of the MP on his uniform. Since there were no wounded left alive in the hospital, it now occurred to the Russians to loot it. The six surviving medics were forced to sit in front of the operation tent with arms covering their heads, guarded by a single Mongol soldier, whose irritation at being excluded from the plunder was fairly evident. Shit, damn! Why have I got to stay here and look after these stupid pigs? Can I just shoot them? he asked the sergeant. Shut your mouth and do what I told you, the sergeant retorted. The old man wants to have a word with them. Perhaps we can make them sing and tell us where their heroic comrades have hidden supplies. One of the German medics understood Russian. They are going to finish us off like they did with the wounded, he whispered. We've had it in any case. At the next opportunity I suggest we make a fight of it and run. Our people can't be too far away. His comrade nodded. OK, I'll kill the Ivan, then we'll run through the operation tent, jump over the amputations trench and then dive into the bushes. We'll keep running until we're safe. Each man looks out for himself but tries to keep contact with the others. The Russians could be heard admiring their booty in loud tones, especially when they found the food store. The Mongol sentry was by now in a passioned torment and had begun to make urgent requests to his comrades to set aside his share. This was the opportunity. The Russians were rummaging through crates and boxes. The sentry watched them in annoyance and was derelict in his task. In a lightning movement, the medic drew a knife from his boot, sprang for his man like a tiger, grabbed the steel helmet by the forward rim, yanked it back into his neck, and throttling the man with the chin strap, removed him from view of his comrades. A second later, with expert anatomical knowledge, the knife went into his right kidney where it was turned in the wound three times for maximum effect. The Russian froze with the sudden terrible pain. The medic suppressed the man's groans by placing a hand over his mouth while lowering him to the ground. To finish the job, he should have cut the sentry's throat. His omission was to cost two more German lives, including his own. The German medics now darted through the long tent. They had not quite reached the far end when the death croak of the Mongol sentry reached the ears of his comrades. Several sprays of MP fire tore through the sailcloth of the tent. The last medic, bloody knife still in his hand, was hit and fell. The others kept running, leapt the open amputations trench, but the fifth caught his foot in a tent line and fell into the trench, stacked high with arms and legs. The fourth had made it to the other side, hesitated, and reached his hand towards the fifth man. As the latter rose, a burst of MP fire caught him in the back. The four survivors made the adjacent bushes and escaped. The hail of bullets fired into the thick vegetation all missed. Veterans always carried with them a small hand compass, and one of the medics had one, which saved their lives. It took them two days to hunt down the retreating German forces and elude the enemy. After reporting the names of the dead to the commanding officer, they took their place within the marching column, alone with the memory of their recent harrowing experience. We had not eaten for days. We were filthy, flea-ridden, and at the end of our physical endurance. Arriving at the new battle line, we received a briefing. The division was all but out of small arms ammunition. Everybody had to consider very carefully whether he needed to fire at any particular moment. Only the strictest self-discipline and composure would see us through in the coming battles. 
The alternative was the certainty that the front would crumble, and that meant death in Russian captivity. The private soldier needed to know no more. The German front line had developed into a bulge, which the Soviets were proposing to tie off rather like a sack. German 6th Army commanders were engaged in a last-ditch effort to stave off the threatened encirclement. However, had it not been for the lack of coordination between the various Russian armies, the pincer movement could not have been stopped. Fifteen German divisions were now concentrated into a wedge. Their purpose was to break out, cross the Ingoles River, keep going for the Bug River, cross to the West Bank, and dig in. 3rd GD had been chosen to spearhead this operation. It was first to the Ingoles, and found a suitable crossing point. A battalion of sappers installed a portable dam, while Soviet attacks were disjointed and easily withstood. Meanwhile, advance units of GJR 138 and 144 occupied bridgeheads to secure the crossing and fight off any enemy response. On 15 March 1944, heavy rains preceded strong winds with violent hail and later a blizzard. Without proper shelter and lacking any hope of medical treatment, the advance guard huddled together in their holes in the ground, feverish and shivering. It was in low spirits that our motley unit plodded towards the bridgehead alongside columns of 3rd GD vehicles. The size of the evacuation lent a feeling of security. At the approach to the Ingulas, I saw through intense hail the two regimental commanders in discussion with their staffs about how to defend the crossing point. I was approaching to report my presence when, while still about thirty metres away, there came a warning shout. Achtung! Ivan! Tank! At that moment, a T-34 became dimly visible and opened fire with its MGs. A horse was hit and began to whinny pitifully while our troops dispersed and sprinted for cover. An SP gun attempted to manoeuvre into position to return fire. The horse was the personal mount of Oberst Graf von der Goltz, regimental commander GJR 138. The animal had a gaping wound in the hind quarters. Instead of seeking cover, the Oberst went to his horse. Some of the regimental staff officers had thrown themselves to the ground as the tank turret swivelled to take them under fire. Flames leapt from the muzzle of the beast's main gun and the shell, narrowly missing the prostrate officers, turned a group of vehicles into a heap of twisted and burning metal. Metal splinters hummed and whistled through the air. The belly of the horse was ripped wide open. The oberst fell as if hit by an unseen iron fist. The German SP gun fired at the tank and hit the turret. There was a dull explosion and the T-34 burst into flame. The occupants were probably fried, for they made no attempt to escape. Within minutes the danger had passed. I saw the oberst struggle to his feet. His right arm was gone, except for a jagged piece of bone jutting from the socket. Dumbstruck and in panic, he stared at the injury for a few seconds before collapsing unconscious. Then help came running. For me it was simply another episode in everyday life, but for the division it was a serious loss. Fonda Goltz had been an outstandingly competent leader of men and personally brave. An unconventional officer who throughout his career had been continually at odds with his superiors, with the Gebirgsjäger, he had finally discovered the kind of leadership he could live with and the opportunity to develop his abilities to the full. He was also the only third GD commander who wore the oak leaves. After a few days, I learnt that the Oberst had died of gangrene in a military hospital at Odessa. On 16th March 1944, the Russians intensified their pressure on the bridgeheads held by GJR 138 and 144. The fighting was hectic but the defenders held out. 3rd GD was one of the last divisions across the Ingules, the tail of the withdrawal being covered by a small rearguard. Here the sniper could come into his own, holding reconnaissance platoons and infantry battle units at a suitable distance while obtaining valuable information about the enemy. During this stage of the retreat to the Bug River, our divisions were very vulnerable, and it was essential to keep the enemy undecided as to our true intentions for as long as possible. The purpose of the rearguard was to offer delaying tactics until the bulk of the main force had reached its new position, to deliberately remain in contact with the enemy, 
To influence his decisions and movements in this manner required a great deal of discipline and heart, and only the veteran MG gunner or sniper could be relied upon for the kind of precision work required. Without doubt the sniper provided the most effective form of rearguard. In his disguised hide, he awaited the cautiously advancing enemy unit, observed its strength and equipment, then forced it to ground with two or three rounds of rapid accurate fire bearing the hallmark of the sniper. This was often sufficient to stop advancing infantry in their tracks for hours at a time. During the Ingoles retreat, the German units moved out at night. I remained behind in one of several carefully prepared positions that were not only well hidden, but provided some security against the effects of shelling. The important thing was that they should offer me the opportunity to make a fast escape unseen. If possible, I looked for suitable places in no man's land so that our own trenches and foxholes were included in my general scheme. When I abandoned the area, I left behind booby traps made of hand grenades and trip wires. Here the idea was to sow confusion among the enemy during his advance, forcing him to withdraw or present me with a couple of inviting targets for effect. The sport of resistance and withdrawal went on for four days. Each day I noticed how the Russians had become a little more cautious. In the end I would only manage one or two successful hits daily, for most of them went to earth and stayed there. They became expert at using cover, their preoccupation being to assume total invisibility. My first opportunity for a precise shot had been about hundred meters from my hide, probably an observer who had settled behind some bushes, but betrayed his position by moving incautiously. I noticed the unnatural movement of the leaves and on scrutiny through the telescopic sight made out his silhouette. I aimed at its centre. The hectic trembling of the bush twigs confirmed a hit. I waited on tenterhooks to see what the Russians did next. Nothing. All quiet on the Ingules front. After an hour I became jittery. Something was not right here. Intently I surveyed no man's land through binoculars but found no sign of life. My muscles ached and I felt the need for a stretch and crossed my legs. I had just laid my right foot on the left heel when I heard a rifle shot from the Russian side and felt a heavy blow to my right heel. I curled up instinctively deep in my foxhole to examine my painful injury. The entire heel had been shot off the boot and a trail of blood was oozing over the sole. I recognised at once the handiwork of a sniper and he must have been the best, both by his observation work and marksmanship. It had been a masterly shot. Now my own thought was survival. Since my hide had been identified, I could not afford to reveal an inch of myself and remained low. For the moment it seemed that the Russian was uncertain. He had no knowledge about the effect of his bullet, and so we had a standoff. Nobody on the Soviet side was prepared to risk showing himself, and my closest examination of the terrain revealed no trace of my opponent. My hope was that the latter would lie low until the fall of darkness, when I could withdraw unseen. The hours dragged until eventually the onset of night freed me from the trap. I found the exit path I had marked towards the neighbouring company's sector. Next day I remained particularly alert, but luckily my path did not again cross that of my Russian counterpart. A couple of days later the rearguard reached the Bug River and crossed to the west bank unseen. Our installations on the river bank were solid and of good quality. Having been set up two years earlier during the days of our eastward advance, and little extra work had been required to make them comfortable. Meanwhile, the Russians surprised us by leaving us entirely to our own devices, and we spent a whole week not only recuperating, but rearming and re-equipping. Even some reserves came up. It was like being on holiday. We slept eight hours per day, had regular meals and the occasional shower. But the idyll was short-lived. On the night of 26th March 1944, Using the cover of darkness, Russian assault troops crossed the bug unobserved and set up a bridgehead below the cliff where battalion was quartered. At first light, the band of toughened veterans stole into the trenches and overcame the sentries with knives and sharpened entrenching tools. No shots were fired, no prisoners taken. The day was saved by an alert MG gunner. Observing the opposite bank 200 metres away through binoculars, 
he noticed a kind of raft or float being let down into the water and quickly checked the German positions. Glimpsing for a fraction of a second the tops of two Russian helmets above the trench parapet, he raised the alarm. Shooting broke out, MPs stuttered, cries were heard. The Russian raid had been detected at last, and violent hand-to-hand -hand fighting started in the trenches. In seconds the German defenders were wide awake, armoured and manning their positions. The Soviets had embarked upon an amphibious crossing of the Bug, mindless of the murderous defensive fire. Since they had neglected to bring up a single artillery piece to cover them, relying entirely on the element of surprise, we held all the trumps and the invasion from the river was soon in serious difficulties. However, a dangerous situation was developing in the trenches, which we had begun to lose piecemeal section by section. A group had been formed to repulse the infiltration, and this had been partially successful, but the Russians were hanging on to what they had captured, as if their lives depended on it. I was picking off Russians in the boats one by one, when an NCO, watching the fighting in the trenches through field glasses, drew my attention to a soldier wearing a white fur cap, apparently the group commander, who was continually seen in the midst of the fighting and seemed to be animating the fierce Russian resistance. I think the fine fur cap over there is the leader. If you can knock him out, our people can finish the rest off. I knew how an officer leading his men in the thick of things could motivate people to fight, and the demoralising effect when he fell. With a couple of strides I reached a bend in the trench complex from where I had a good field of fire and a place to rest my rifle. With regard to the importance of the task in hand, I decided to expend one of my precious explosive rounds. These were found only rarely in captured ammunition. I prepared the weapon and awaited my chance for the fatal shot. The NCO was my observer, watching the opposite trench through his binoculars. Suddenly the fur cap appeared above the trench parapet. There, Sep, to the right, the NCO yelled. I swung the weapon, but the target had already disappeared. Sep, he's making to the right. Wait a bit and you'll see the cap appear above the trench. I had worked out the rhythm of my opponent. He would soon pass across the sapper's entrance, giving me a split second to shoot him. I aimed the crosswires of the sight on the entrance at head height and awaited the decisive moment. Suddenly, 120 metres distant, the target head filled the sight, my shot rang out and hit. Through our respective optics, the NCO and I saw the white fur cap swell like a balloon, then burst like an overripe watermelon. Deprived of their commander, the Russians appeared at once confused and disoriented. Our own assault force used the opportunity to storm the occupied trenches. In the ensuing fighting, the veteran invaders were wiped out to the last man. I returned my attentions to the Riverborne invasion force immediately, and my observer had taken up his carbine. The value of the sniper lies in his ability to distribute a rapid and very accurate fire. The infantry aboard the boats and floats, recognising that they posed an easy target from the shore, had disembarked very early from the craft in the effort to escape the withering fire. Firing at the heads in the water was just target practice for the sniper. The Russians gave no heed to casualties, and the water was red with their blood, rather like the waste drain at a slaughterhouse. A bloody broth of corpses, limbs and internal body organs drifted gently down the stream towards the Black Sea. A neighbouring sector of the line was captured by the Soviets, but despite the exposed flank, GJR-144 repelled everything the Russians could throw at it and held its trenches until 27th March 1944, when 3rd GD was ordered to retire to the Dnester, 300 kilometres to the southwest. This involved a 48-hour enforced march to get clear of the area, but the Russians were wise to it, having learnt their First World War lessons well and kept on our heels. To add to our problems, the supply line had been severed, and we received no ammunition, provisions, and worst of all, no anti-tank weapons. The last lorry to get through brought two tons of bitter chocolate and five hundred iron crosses. This kind of administrative lunacy drove us to despair. The daily fare was now half a bar of bitter chocolate and a ship's biscuit, rich in ballast and very good for those vulnerable to loose motions. 
The two days' forced march failed to bring about the hoped-for respite. The Russians maintained their stranglehold on the division, and the retreat soon degenerated into an ugly free-for-all without well-drawn battle lines. The Soviets were everywhere, creating islands of German resistance that had no option but to fight on alone in the hope of regaining contact later with the main group. The Russian infantry had a new battlefield vehicle, armoured half-tracks for infantry transport supplied under the terms of the US Lend-Lease Pact. These machines were obviously very useful for getting Russian soldiers into and behind our lines, where they would disembark and immediately start fighting. The danger could be averted with anti-tank guns, but we had nothing more powerful than hand grenades to do the job. With a rumble of motor and a clanking of tread, the half-tracks made for our positions. With no time to spare, we discussed quickly how we were to combat this new peril, since hand grenades seemed so unpromising a solution. Through field glasses I examined the approaching vehicles for a weak point. The front was armour-plated with the driver located in a wheelhouse, vision being afforded by a viewing slit small in size. In my estimation, the chance of a hit with a rifle shot was not good, but was probably the only way to stop the vehicle. I took careful note of the intervening terrain for likely course changes. The half-track was moving at walking pace. I loaded one explosive round and rolled a tent into a rest for the rifle barrel, aimed the weapon and watched the approach for my chance. Taking calm, measured breaths, I got the viewing slit in the crosswires and took up some pressure on the trigger. The machine was about 60 metres off, when for a brief moment I saw the eyes of the driver through the viewing slit, possibly judging the ground ahead. I fired. A hit. At once the vehicle slewed and rutted sideways into a shell crater, the tracks continuing to turn and ensuring that it got well and truly stuck. The incumbent Russian soldiers abandoned the useless conveyance in panic, and being met at once by heavy fire from our riflemen, were forced back into the crater for protection. It appeared that the driver's cabin was partitioned off from the passenger area, making it impossible to relieve him at the controls in an emergency. I had found the Achilles' heel, and hopes grew that this might be the answer. Using my last twenty explosive rounds, I managed to kill or wound seven of the twelve half-track drivers that day. The other five got through our lines to unload their human freight, but the latter was not quality material and none lived to tell the tale. Although I had been successful, neighbouring divisions were breached at many points, forcing us to pull back yet again to an organised defensive line. To our astonishment, OKH sent to our aid a number of Romanian bomber aircraft and an anti-tank detachment. They destroyed 24 Russian tanks and gave us the breathing space needed to construct a new defensive line. After fighting for months without air support, the sight of friendly aircraft seemed almost surreal. Nevertheless, the regiment remained under severe pressure. Although the line held, we lost a third of our fighting personnel. Eventually the Soviets gave it up and switched their effort to a much weaker sector a few kilometres further on. A unit composed mainly of youngsters fresh from basic training was wiped out. In the uncanny silence, the men of GJR 144 grabbed a few hours desperately needed sleep. On 2nd April 1944, Russian armour broke through the lines and encircled 3rd GD. There was no time to waste before attempting to escape. A very risky operation beckoned since we were equipped only with small arms and grenades, our only ally being the very inclement weather. That evening, in a blizzard reducing visibility to 50 metres, the thousand or so survivors of the regiment left their positions to form a long column two or three abreast. Everything possible was done to bring along the wounded. A fate worse than death awaited those who fell into the hands of the Russians. At the last farewell, many of the wounded requested a pistol to determine for themselves the hour of their passing. A final handshake of mutual understanding. Then the blizzard separated us from them forever. While still in earshot, we heard the first pistol shots ring out. As usual, I had my sniper's rifle wrapped in a tent and slung across my back, and carried an MP40 at the breast for ready use. I was a member of the platoon protecting the right flank. We had been on the way for about an hour, 
when I heard marching feet and snatches of conversation a few metres away to the right. I assumed that I had caught up with other platoon members in the poor visibility and fell back a little. Several minutes later a number of shadows became visible, and I froze in horror as I heard the Russian in which they were conversing. We were marching parallel to a Soviet phalanx. I slipped away to rejoin our column, and my expression was enough to convey the situation. Rapid hand signals passed from man to man. No word was spoken. Hardly daring to breathe, we bore away from the Russian unit. A short while later, but still enveloped in the darkness of early morning, the division came to a buzzy highway that crossed our direction of retreat. After an hour of watching the soldiery and traffic passing along it, the commander formed the opinion that we could not get the whole regiment across the highway without the procedure being seen, and the order was given to stage a surprise raid as a diversionary measure. The assault platoon, five veterans and myself, lurked in the vegetation watching the passage of a supply column. Using a forty-metre gap between lorries, we sprang out a few metres in front of the oncoming vehicle and sprayed the driver's cab with a burst of MP-40 fire. Two of us lobbed grenades into the interior from the rear. The lorry sheared towards the undergrowth, and as the grenades exploded, came to a rest at an angle straddling a ditch. The cab door opened, and in the pale light of the burning interior, the driver stood for a brief moment, streaming blood and gurgling before pitching face forward to the ground. At once we switched attention to the next lorry while the various companies of our regiment scurried across the highway. Within a few minutes the darkness had swallowed them up. We suffered no casualties. After regrouping we continued our trudge towards the estuary of the Kutschurgen River. Our retreat ended 25 kilometres short of this natural defensive barrier near the town of Bakalov. Russian armour had already taken it and encircled five German divisions, 3rd GD and 17, 258, 294 and 302 infantry divisions in the process. The pocket was eight kilometres long by four broad. Bakalov town was along the western perimeter, the highest topographical point being 140 metres. The German units were in a desperate plight, battalions being composed of half-strength companies armed only with light infantry weapons and grenades. The men were starving and in poor physical condition, but the fear of falling into Russian hands had concentrated their minds powerfully. Wittmann, commanding General 3rd GD, was in overall command, his immediate priority being to break out of the encirclement and reach the German lines along the west bank of the Kutschurgen. Besides the failure of logistics, the communications network had collapsed and messages were being passed by runners, wasting valuable hours that should have been devoted to planning the breakout strategy. The plan was finally settled upon during the afternoon of 5th April 1944, and at five o'clock third, GD spearheaded the assault on Bakalov. The Russians were clearly surprised at the fighting spirit of these worn-down German troops and offered so little resistance that Bakalov was in our hands by nine that evening. GJR 144 took over a small village a few kilometres west of the town. This strategy had come into being following the receipt of information regarding a second encirclement nearby, of which 24 Army Corps was the victim. In order to kill two birds with one stone and give the breakout operation greater impact, General Wittmann decided that the two encirclements should be breached in concert, his main fear being that the Army Corps movement would be too slow and stall. Unfortunately, he could not contact 24 Army Corps, so in order to bring his plan to fruition, he took the dangerous step of suspending his own operation, capturing Bakalov and aiding the Army Corps by having his own divisions bear the brunt of the Russian attack, GJR 144 being among them. The village, whose name I do not recall, was on the northwest perimeter of the encirclement, a typical rural hamlet of the region, twenty or so rude adobe dwellings with thatched roofs against a backdrop of scanty woodland. Together with ten riflemen I took possession of the ruins of an outlying farmhouse and prepared four hides with good cover and field of fire, special care being paid to rapid and protected movement between the five sites. From about seven on the evening of 6 April, the Russians began probing the perimeter at various places, 
and just before half nine the village dwellings were set alight as the prelude to a Cossack cavalry attack at a fast gallop. Highly mobile, they were quickly up to our positions, and in the flickering light of the fires it was almost impossible to get a clear shot at the riders. Accordingly, no matter how much we regretted it, we had to target the horses. I knew the neuralgic spots to aim for from my experiences sniping at Russian transport horses. If the bullet hit around the breastbone, the animal would collapse at once, often falling on the unseated rider. If hit in the kidney intestinal region, the beast would rear up uncontrollably and eventually collapse, death following violent convulsions of the legs. I decided to aim for the breastbone, if possible, and the midriff of those horses further away. The riflemen of my platoon would then pick off the Cossacks at leisure. A number of charges ensued, and within an hour the field was strewn with dead and dying horses and Cossacks. By then I was utterly sick of shooting horses. One Cossack got to within fifty metres of our position. I fired a round into the breastbone of his horse. The instant I did so, the animal jumped over a cadaver and the bullet ripped into the belly region, spilling out its intestines. The animal stopped, quivering, the rider seated as if paralysed on its back. The horse seemed to stare directly at me with wide, sad, questioning eyes, almost as if asking why. I gave the creature the coup de grace in the forehead, while a spray of MP-40 fire finished off the rider. The next wave of cavalry made inroads into our positions, so close that I hid my sniper's rifle and fought with the MP-40. Our original eleven-man platoon had been whittled down to seven, holed up in the rubble of the farmhouse in acute danger. There now followed a brief period of stupidity. The command centres of both sides, German and Russian, through Possessidov, only the sketchiest knowledge of the events in the village, opened fire with artillery and Stalin organs respectively. It lasted only a few minutes, wiped out a Cossack battalion, which was in the open and unprotected, and claimed a few Jaeger. A short respite of eerie silence followed, and then came the next cavalry charge and death ride. Our numbers, inadequate armaments and equipment, and few medical facilities dwindled under the pressure on our makeshift positions. The regiment, 300 strong at the beginning of the action, had 168 dead and wounded, and was cut off from division. Its survival was now in doubt. In this precarious situation, Regimental Commander Oberst Lorch took upon himself the initiative of an immediate breakout attempt for early next morning. The companies were informed by dispatch messengers. It meant leaving behind the worst of the wounded, but there was no alternative. The few surgeons and medics made the rounds classifying the wounded. Those listed to remain were given a pistol if they requested it. The arrangements were made swiftly and without sentimentality. At midday the Field Reserve Battalion northwest of Bakalov encountered extraordinarily accurate fire from a patch of dense woodland. Within a few minutes, eleven of their number had fallen to rifle bullets to the head or chest. The cry of snipers drove the remainder to cover. Two company commanders who rose too high for a peep with binoculars paid with their lives, heads splayed by explosive rounds. The number of hits led to only one conclusion. The battalion was facing a sniper company. We had heard rumours of such a thing, but so far had only ever come up against marksmen operating singly. Lacking artillery or mortars, the battalion was helpless. Fire was coming from the impenetrable vegetation of a small forest of conifers. Bursts of MG fire had no apparent effect, and the devastating response it evoked was usually fatal for the gunner who tried it. The Jaegers fell back on protected positions, such as behind the crumbling walls of a ruined collective. A dispatch rider was sent to regimental headquarter with a report and request for support. The battalion was hoping for a few heavy weapons to destroy the forest and those hiding in it, but nothing was available. My reputation was known even to Oberst Lorch, but he probably considered it to be little more than a token response when he gave the messenger a written instruction for 144 Battalion Command Centre, ordering marksman Alaberga to engage a full Russian sniper company. Three hours later I was being briefed on the situation in the ruined collective. The edge of the woods lay about 300 metres from these ruins. Given the depth of the wooded area I realised I would need to get nearer, 
and tempt the Russians into shooting to betray their positions. This required a lure. I stuffed five grenade holders with grass and set a steel helmet on top of each. With a stick burnt to carbon, I applied a nose, mouth and eyes. From my pack, I brought out an umbrella frame minus the handle. I attached grasses and twigs to the spokes, leaving just a small aperture free for vision. One hundred metres to the right of the building was a shallow depression skirted by bushes, an ideal spot for observation, which I could reach by crawling, unseen by the enemy. I agreed a hand signal at which one or other of the lures would be raised cautiously above the wall of the ruin. Twenty minutes later, I was in position and set up my umbrella screen very carefully so that the movement and the slight change to the scenery were imperceptible. I could now sweep the wood visually through binoculars. An analysis of the enemy rounds fired demonstrated that they had a good view of our positions. This suggested height, probably the treetops. It seemed unlikely to me, however, that expert snipers would make such a cardinal error and fire from a tree without adequate cover or an escape route. I gave the agreed sign, and the helmeted lures made a cautious show. A rain of bullets greeted them from the Russian lines. This provided me with a good view of several tree branches moving unnaturally under the pressure of the muzzle blast. The fact that the enemy was shooting from the treetops and that all five lures had attracted simultaneous fire told me these were good marksmen lacking elementary field craft. This lessened my worries somewhat as I contemplated taking on a very large handful of opponents. I crawled back to the ruin at once and discussed the situation with the senior sergeant who was now commander of both companies following the death of the two officers. We set up five MGs in positions with a good arc of fire towards the woods and adequate local protection. To the side, some distance away, a rifleman waited to operate a lure. While I observed the woodland through binoculars, on my instruction he raised it from cover slowly. If it attracted a shot, I would identify the location from where it had originated. The MG would then fire a burst in the general direction of the trees, masking my aimed round. It was important to conceal from the Soviets the fact that they had a sniper working against them. The tactical battle began. The lure rose and received three rounds, as if to order. I saw the movement in the trees, took aim, waited for the MG to fire, then pulled the trigger. One by one the Russian snipers dropped from the trees, dead. After a quick change of position, a new round of the duel began. Within an hour I had reckoned on eighteen kills, but still the lures drew fire. It was at about five in the afternoon, and an hour since the last shot had been loosed off from the woods, that the sergeant decided on storming the woods under the cover of the two MGs and myself. They reached the woods unopposed, looked with astonishment at the corpses, and gesticulated wildly for us to join them. Cautiously, unhappy with the deceptive lull, we crossed the open land to the trees. A young woman, scarcely twenty, lay on her stomach, her rifle below her. A Yaga turned the inert body to one side to retrieve her weapon. Her right hand was inside her uniform jacket, covering the gaping wound in her chest. As the Yaga bent down, she drew a Tokarev pistol, and, gurgling blood, mouthed the expression, Death to the Fascists, before pulling the trigger with the last ounce of her strength. As the German soldier dived to one side, the bullet grazed the seat of his pants. As he rolled free, his MP40 came free, and he fired into the female torso, ending her valiant career. It was the first time we had come up against female frontline warriors. As we stood over their dead bodies, some with shattered bloody masks of flesh and bone instead of faces and features, we all felt a sense of revulsion and shame, even though we knew that there had been no alternative. If we had known in advance that we were facing women, the knowledge might well have interfered with our determination to rout out the opposition, and resulted in many more casualties amongst our ranks. The use of sniper groups was a Russian tactic that originated under German influence. During the post-First World War phase of mutual cooperation, the Weimar Republic had supplied the Soviets with the technology to manufacture telescopic sights, the use of such optics being unknown hitherto among the Russian forces. 
While the Wehrmacht was still issuing old Reichswehr sites in 1940, the Red Army had developed a comprehensive sniper branch with modern weapons. There were single operators, sniper and observer pairs, sniper pairs and companies up to 60 strong. From the beginning of the German invasion, Russian snipers harried the Wehrmacht, inflicting serious losses, particularly on officers, and by this means were often able to halt for days the advance of infantry lacking heavy weapons. In the heady period of victories in 1941, OKH dismissed the sniper danger as an irrelevance, and only in 1942 was the problem grudgingly acknowledged. The lack of a useful sniper rifle for the Wehrmacht was now critical, and the Model 41 with 1.5x magnification issued as a target aid for precision shooting with the 98K carbine over long distances was found totally unsuitable. There was nothing for it but to improvise while German industry tackled the whole problem. The simple solution was to use captured Russian weapons. Guidelines for snipers were issued for the first time towards the end of 1942, but the first firm instructions in rifle use and sniper deployment were not available until May 1943. According to these rules, snipers were to be directly under the control of company commanders and exempt from daily routine. Their role was special reconnaissance and sharpshooting, as their survival depended to a large degree on their remaining unseen by the enemy. The veterans among them developed a knack for wandering terrain unnoticed. Contrary to the later official training manuals or propaganda films, full-dress camouflage was rarely used. It was time-consuming, required a lot of material and restricted freedom of movement. Every sniper who lived long enough to adjust to the life used improvised camouflage aids that could be donned or erected quickly, interfered little with movement and were easy to transport. For myself, I preferred an umbrella frame with the crooked handle cut off. It was easy to dress with grasses and twigs to blend in with the natural environment and big enough to screen me. When not in use, it was easily collapsible and fitted into my battle pack. At first light on 6 April 1944, Gruppe Lorsch attacked the encirclement at the northern perimeter below the 140-metre spot height, all reserves being called upon in the desperate struggle to escape. The official records speak of a heroic action planned and executed to the last detail, but the reality was organised chaos blessed with good fortune. Many men lost their nerve and fled in panic beforehand. Shortly before the decisive attack, I was queuing at the last field kitchen to fill my tea flask, when through the swathes of morning mist there came the sound of roaring motors and squeaking tracks. Everybody stared towards the noise, straining to make out the tanks. There was still nothing to see when a hysterical voice yelled, It's Ivan! He's here! Tanks! Most of the Jaeger broke and ran. The catering sergeant mounted his horse in a flying leap and whipped the animal into a gallop. Tea from the open containers aboard the wheeled field kitchen slopping in all directions. A few of the veterans tried to halt the panic. A few cuffs to the ear and kicks to the rear brought some of the men to their senses, but more than half had disappeared into the mist behind the field kitchen. The remainder waited for the death-dealing T-34s to materialise through the fog, and a few minutes later the German SP guns, which had been sent up unannounced in support of the breakout, made their appearance. It was another half hour before the last of the fleeing made their sheepish return and accepted a kick in the pants as a disciplinary measure for their action. By evening the breakout by Gruppe Loch through the Russian lines had been achieved. The main force, Gruppe Wittmann, forced the Russian encirclement northwest of Bakalov and German units poured through in disorder. The objective was the Kutschurgen River via the town of Getmansi. It was several hours before fighting units and engineers re-established contact between the respective groups. We had progressed about seven miles westward from the perimeter and had reached the railway tunnel south of the town of Petrovsky when there occurred a most dreadful incident amongst our own troops. My own battalion had been reduced to a pitiful rump of about sixty men, as always in these retreats and common to both sides. Scorched earth policy meant leaving the enemy with an infrastructure in smouldering ruins. Orders had been received to blow up the railway tunnel south of Petrovsky, 
which for the time being was an important conduit for our troops. Our battalion was the last through it, and we saw the sappers making their last preparations to dynamite it. Hauptmann Kloss told the engineer's officer that a troop of our own engineers was following as a rear guard and that the demolition should be delayed until they were safely through the tunnel, but the explosive sappers were jittery, and when the rear guard had not shown within ten minutes, they dynamited the tunnel. Another ten minutes had passed when two filthy, dirty and distraught battalion engineers of the rear guard rejoined Gruppe Lorsch and reported that the tunnel had been blown up as they were passing through it. The two men had only survived because they had gone ahead as the advance party of the rear guard. The story was received with incredulity, then anger and rage. The battalion marched on, and half an hour later reached the agreed assembly point. A sentry called out suddenly, Stop! Stand still! Password! A rifleman of the advance party told him where to stuff his password, and kept walking. The following column watched with horror as a machine gunner opened fire, raking the back of the infantryman. Seconds later all threw themselves prostrate to the ground. Our commander pushed his way through to the front and shouted, Cease fire, you asshole! This is the Kloss Battalion. Fetch your superior officer immediately. A few minutes later an Oberleutnant appeared and asked a few questions, which Kloss answered in bad humour. Finally, he received the instruction to approach alone. Kloss rose cautiously, and holding his pistol at the ready, went forward. He was trembling with rage. At the feet of the Oberleutnant, Kloss saw the killer gunner sitting behind his weapon. He was no more than a youngster, convulsed with fear. Kloss roared at him. You filthy shit! You have killed a comrade, and now I am going to kill you, you swine! His hysteria built to a high pitch and became rapidly uncontrollable before he gave a long cry and emptied the magazine of his pistol into the youth, who watched his death at the hands of a German officer with eyes wide in panic. The nearest rifleman wrestled Kloss to the ground, slapped his face and forced him to calm himself. Aside from these men and the Oberleutnant, the latter of whom understood this momentary nervous breakdown on Kloss's part, there were no witnesses to the incident, and thus no further action was ever taken. The two soldiers had merely fallen for the Führer and Greater Germany, but as to the circumstances of their passing, nobody could be found subsequently who knew. That evening Gruppe Loch re-established radio contact with a neighbouring Wittmann battalion to the south of us. The outlook was not good. The structure of the latter had disintegrated, and numerous independent units were involved in continual skirmishing during the 25-kilometre chase to the Kutschurgen River. Towards ten, Wittmann's HQ picked up a signal from 97 Jager Division, calling all German units behind a new front line on the bank of the river, 97 Jager Division having prepared crossing points protected with the support of 257 Infantry Division. It was fairly desperate for the Russians in hot pursuit were lobbing large quantities of mortars into the retreating columns. Wittmann assembled his last artillery pieces into a battery and surprised them with a bombardment. It gained his advanced companies a breathing space, but the Russians were prompt to turn their attentions to the breach in the encirclement through which Gruppe Wittmann was still pouring. The enemy opened up a withering fire, but this was countered by desperate hand-to-hand, fighting supported by sniper, fire concentrated on Russian MG positions and mortars. After an hour, the determination of the Soviets wilted and the breach held. It was a moonless night and little further contact was reported. At nine on the morning of 7 April 1944, the first of Gruppe Wittmann's force crossed the Kutschurgen. His five divisions totaled 4,500 men. Third GD had less than a thousand survivors. We kept on going for three more days, crossing the Dniester on 10 April. It was a portentous moment, the end of Barbarossa, for we had passed it beyond the territorial limits of the Soviet Union and entered Romanian Bessarabia. After three years of the most bitter fighting and horrendous losses, all now knew beyond the slightest doubt that the war was being brought ever closer to the Reich. The enemy we faced on this front had to be held, forever if possible, a tiny spark of hope still glimmered that somewhere, somehow, we could stop him permanently. 
Whenever I had time, I would reflect on what made a good sniper. In warfare, soldiers are faced with the constant threat of serious injury, mutilation and death. Many crumble under the psychological burden and panic under pressure. This often manifests in firing off wildly or creating a mental disposition to run once things begin to deteriorate. A soldier's resistance to stress determines his quality far more than his marksmanship or other technical ability. For this reason, a sniper in prospect is difficult to spot away from the front. In particular, the selection and training of a future sniper basset only on shooting ability is a grave error, for the soldier must be possessed of a high degree of self-control and have nerves of steel. Good accurate shooting can be learnt, and the value placed on it by the military in the initial stages of the selection process is exaggerated. The maximum effective range for a rifle under battle conditions is 400 metres, but as a general rule half that when aiming to hit the greatest surface area of the target centrally. Absolute reliability, adherence to military routine, ruthlessness and the art of sharpshooting make the sniper not target shooting at 100 metres. So far as I can recall, the only occasion when I dressed in full camouflage gear occurred shortly after our arrival at the Dniester. We set about making our trenches homely and created a sort of village organisation based on the regiment. From thin air all kinds of utensils were produced, washrooms and showers, barbers' saloons. Poultry appeared as if by magic, treasured for their flesh and eggs and naturally guarded by their owners like the crown jewels. Foxes the human kind lurked in the shadows, casting covetous eyes at what was on offer, and the successful poultry thief was a man to be revered among the lower orders. The battalion dispatch runners, to whom I was on semi-permanent detachment, had little opportunity to cultivate company life. Their efforts for a better diet had led them down the slippery road to crimey. Their distrustful comrades watched them like hawks, but it was only a question of time before the big coop. Freely wandering the battalion lines, it had come to my notice that the CSM of the neighbouring company owned a hen, named Josephine, which could be relied upon to produce an egg daily for the CSM's table or barter. A single bird was an ideal target for abduction, for if one exercised due caution the danger of a general cacophony, such as one might expect from a disturbed flock, was absent. I was elected unanimously for the job on account of my field craft, since my red Indian instincts, not to mention cat-like agility, made me the perfect choice. It was a night of the new moon and fully overcast, ideal for a commando raid of this kind. While the others stoked the fire and prepared the cooking utensils, for the first and only time I put on full camouflage dress, blacked my hands and face, and attached leafy vegetation to my peaked cap and uniform until I looked like a bush. After receiving brief instruction from a former poultry farmer in the technique of killing a bird by hand, I disappeared into the darkness, rustling lightly in the wind. Like a fox I slunk into the headquarter of the neighbouring company. The hen was sleeping in her nest, a lovingly furbished wicker basket for artillery ammunition. There was a sentry about twenty metres away in conversation with a friend. They were sharing a cigarette, and every time either took a drag, they raised a steel helmet to their faces so that the glow from the cigarette should not betray them to the enemy. I was more on tenterhooks than normal, for this was looting, and the penalty for detection could easily be the firing squad. Scarcely daring to breathe, I lifted the catch of the wicker basket. The hen was sleeping with her head under a wing. I could not afford to make a mistake. Keeping the lid up by resting it against my forehead, I seized the bird with both hands and swiftly put her to sleep permanently. With a glance at the sentry, who was chatting and had seen nothing, I stuffed the dead Josephine inside my camouflage jacket and disappeared as silently as I had arrived. Within fifteen minutes the bird was plucked and eviscerated, and the inedible evidence carefully buried. On the morning following the grand feast, the CSM appeared and declared that he was in no doubt as to the perpetrators of the crime. Which filthy swine stole my hen? It can only have been your company because the thief's footprints lead here. None of my men would have dared lay a hand on Josephine. I would have shot him personally. Our facial expressions of hurt and reproach at the implication appeared to weaken his resolve, 
and muttering to himself, the CSM withdrew after making it clear that he had narrowed his suspicions down to one person, but had no proof. He promised not to relent, however, and should the evidence he needed be unearthed in due course, the person involved would be court-martialed and shot for looting. Third GD, desperately short of men and weapons, received a token influx, mainly survivors from other divisions, which helped little. We were also given a stiffening of Romanian units. Our Axis ally was very poorly equipped and armed, lacked battle experience and proved of equally limited value. On 17 April 1944, only ten days after our arrival on the Dniester, orders came for a third of 3rd GD to bolster another sector of the front under serious threat. It was my good fortune to remain behind on this occasion, for GJR 138 Kampfgruppe Rode was to suffer fearful casualties with over 800 dead. For a few weeks I enjoyed Halcyon days with the remainder of the division. May was a warm, gentle month, and after the troubles we had gone through to get here, our front line with a river view on the banks of the Dniester came as a delightful surprise. Germans and Russians faced each other across the river within the range of heavy infantry weapons, but limited their hostilities to the occasional exchange of mortar and MG fire and the odd commando raid to break the monotony. The river was about 400 metres wide and did not allow for reconnaissance outings by snipers. I visited the battalion trenches daily, but did no more than fire the occasional precision shot at targets spotted by our infantry. Aiming at a Soviet head 400 metres off had a 30% chance of a hit, but the effect on morale of 70%. Hair's breadth misses from a sniper's rifle made the effort worthwhile. As regular as clockwork, I made my calls on the trenches. The Russians had been lying low for days, for they were loath to show themselves once they had received notice that an expert sniper was present in the German lines opposite. That particular morning, I had been with the MG gunners surveying the enemy positions without finding a worthwhile target, and decided to pass the afternoon at the northern end of the battalion's trenches. I rarely went there, for they overlooked a bend in the river a kilometre wide, and I considered them valueless. Sometimes the belligerents exchanged MG bursts, but the range was far too long for a rifle. In our positions the mood was rather like a holiday camp. The May heat wave had gone on and on, and we had become accustomed to stripping to the waist to soak up the sunshine. Improvised showers had been rigged using the waters of the Dniester, and wonderful small picnics of ship's biscuit, tinned marmalade and ersatz coffee were quite common. At the northernmost trench I was invited to partake, the fare being all the more delicious for having been liberated from the Kubelwagen of two artillery officers who had visited the area the day before on a reconnaissance outing. During the conversation, an MG gunner mentioned hearing unusual sounds borne on the wind from the Russian side of the river. He thought the nearest thing to it he had ever heard was at a municipal outdoor swimming pool on a bank holiday weekend. This awakened my interest, and I decided to investigate. Between this last trench and the southernmost of the neighbouring battalion was a stretch of unoccupied terrain which promised a different view of the Russian lines. About 1,500 metres further on was a small hill covered with dense bushy undergrowth offering extensive cover for observation purposes. I climbed to the hilltop from behind and peered cautiously through the high grass between two bushes. Through my binoculars I saw an extraordinary scene. Hidden from the view of our positions was a small bay. The Soviets obviously believed themselves so safe there that it was being used as a holiday beach, and, so far as I could make out, sentries and lookouts had been dispensed with. I estimated the range as 600 metres. The day was windless and the air dry. I decided to try a body shot at one of the bathers over this enormous distance. Why did I do this? It was a mixture of several things, displeasure at our unspeakable opponents doing anything that remotely approached having a good time, my personal ambition to score a kill at this distance, and my belief in the need to make our determination unmistakably clear to the Russians at every opportunity that we were as serious as they were. I selected the largest and most immobile target. On the slope of the riverbank opposite, a group of Russians lay sunbathing in the sand, 
their bodies facing towards me. As I was in an elevated shooting position, it was almost the same as if they were standing. With my bayonet I dug out some clumps of earth and moulded them into a firm rest for the barrel of my rifle. I lined the crosswires of the telescopic sight above the head of the selected victim, breathed regularly and calmly a few times, took up pressure on the trigger, held my breath, concentrated on the target one last time, and fired. Like the crack of a whip, the projectile broke the stillness. After the recoil, I had the target under observation within a fraction of a second. The bullet entered the Russian just above the navel, and he folded like a penknife. I even heard his cry of pain and the panic-filled voices of his comrades. As he rolled to one side, I saw the giant pool of blood he left in the sand. The other Russians had scampered for cover and left him to it. After a few minutes, his movements froze and death took him. Meanwhile, I saw through my binoculars a number of uniformed Russians appear above the slope. It looked like they meant business. A few moments later, I heard the dull retort of a mortar being fired. The grenade landed on the riverbank below me and exploded. Obviously, they had spotted my position and I had to beat a hasty retreat. Weasel-like, I sneaked away and ran down the back of the hill to our trenches. As I did so, their mortars got the range of my abandoned hiding place and shredded the hilltop. Upon my return, the host of the coffee hour received me with a certain hostility. Shit, did you have to? He demanded and, turning to his men, told them to get their bunks ready, since Ivan is soon going to give us hell, adding darkly. Herr Fancy Shooter here simply couldn't resist spoiling our idyll. Hardly had the words fallen from his lips than the first MG bursts whistled over our heads, followed by a brief mortar bombardment which fortunately fell long and caused no damage. During the general hiatus, I made myself scarce, since I had no wish to expose myself to any further abuse. The next day, the occasional precision shot hit our positions. Nobody was hurt, but it told us that the Russians had called up a specialist to settle my hash. He would be disappointed, however, for a cross-river duel was out of the question. All the same, I was doubly courteous and watchful. Around 25th May 1944, our period of tranquility ended. The remnant of GJR 138 returned and 3rd GD was ordered to the Oral Pass in the Carpathian Mountains. Our new positions followed the course of the Moldau River separating the two warring armies. In addition to the watery barrier, the wooded slopes of the gently rising mountains provided us with good cover, while the land on the Russian-held side was open plain and easily observed. For once the fates had smiled kindly on the division, for the Russian strongpoint was well to the north of its positions, and locally the Soviets were interested in nothing more alarming than the occasional skirmish. Another unexpected period of tranquility thus became our lot. Really fine summer weather offered our exhausted troops a chance of modest rest and recuperation. We readjusted quickly to trench life, and slept in earth bunkers entered through a low porch of corrugated iron sheeting. A trestle table and benches for eight under the trees endowed the place with a holiday camp look again. For the man in the field, the tension of constant warring very often resulted in a voracious sexual appetite. The outlet for this natural desire for sex was only available when a unit found itself in a relatively quiet situation. While officers and senior NCOs would consort with market girls, female volunteers and Wehrmacht auxiliaries, the common foot soldier was rarely accommodated because of his low rank or standing. The German army considered rape a very serious matter, and the penalty was severe. Local brothels, if they existed at all, would be unable to cope with the demand when a whole division arrived, and in any case, OKH opposed such establishments on principle as sources of venereal disease. Many men actively sought infection with gonorrhea as a means to loser their fit for the front category. The other main venereal scourge of the time, syphilis, was barely treatable, and a condom gave no protection. After contagion there would be a period of remission of several, perhaps many years before its effects began to show, and it was therefore worthless to the malingerer. Gonorrhea showed after a few days, was highly contagious, did not go away and required immediate treatment. 
In order to provide a sexual service and guard against its disadvantages, it was the practice along secure sectors of the front to allow a Wehrmacht field brothel to be set up. For the purpose of preventing the infection and spread of gonorrhea, these brothels had more medics in attendance than girls. Preventive treatment for everybody followed a sex session and was painful and extremely unpleasant, involving as it did a large syringe being forced into the urethra for the purpose of releasing 100 millilitres of a green sulfonamide solution into the genital tubes. All handling of the body parts was carried out by the medic. The disinfectant had to be retained for five minutes and could then be urinated free. It was reported that the latter sensation of relief was more orgasmic than the session which preceded it. Where an advanced stage of gonorrhea was diagnosed, the sufferer was sent to one of several special hospitals known collectively as Ritterberg, where the purpose was not only to cure the disease but to deter the patient from unhealthy future contacts by an unnecessarily barbarous method of treatment and care. Those who became reinfected were court-martialed on a charge of self-mutilation. A Wehrmacht brothel had arrived in the local town. It was staffed by five Romanian girls who charged five Reichsmarks. Privacy was afforded by a Wehrmacht blanket draped over the doorway, behind which lurked a sadistic medic waiting for the Jäger's session of pleasure to terminate and his own to begin. I had recently met up again with sniper Josef Roth, and in our long conversations the brothel question would occasionally arise. Neither of us had known sexual contact with a woman in our lives, and we agreed that this might be the last chance for the experience before death. We were still arguing the pros and cons when I noticed a supply sergeant who had delivered some ammunition and was now sitting on the running board of an Opel Blitz lorry waiting for orders. By his red beard I recognised him as the Viking who had been my platoon commander during my first five days at the front. He had divined our intentions and made us listen to an account of his own experiences at the same brothel, stationed elsewhere a few weeks earlier. His description of the drastic preventive treatment left us both in no doubt that the brief few minutes of pleasure were not worth the consequences. Being of good Catholic upbringing, I was in any case not 100% certain that I wanted my first sexual experience to take place in a Wehrmacht brothel, and by the end of the war had resisted all further temptations. By some miracle the division had been returned unexpectedly to its full quota in men and materials. The officers probably knew by now that we were at full strength for the last time. They had seen the writing on the wall long previously. What kept them all going was the determination to hold off the Russians for as long as possible. The Soviets were massing for another onslaught against the few German and Romanian divisions. The calm before the storm would be the last opportunity for the few long servers in the division who had more or less come through everything without serious injury to see their families, perhaps for one last time. So far as possible they were granted leave. At age 19, and having served ten months on active frontline duty in the German army, I amounted to a veteran, but had a lower priority for leave than fathers of children and men with two years in the army. Moreover, snipers could not be spared from the front. Theoretically, my chances of leave were nil until Hauptmann Kloss, my battalion commander, who held me in regard, found a way to resolve my difficulty. In the last few months of 1943 at the larger military depots, firing ranges were introduced for sniper training. The course lasted four weeks. Those taking part were recruited from recent conscripts, but also included veterans from the front who had been identified by their company commanders as good prospects. They would receive a sniper rifle with telescopic sight and instruction in the art. In Austria, Gebirgsjäger sniper training was held at the Sitaler Alpa military depot near Judenburg. This was not too far from my home village. Hauptmann Kloss had downgraded me to a sniper prospect in need of honing to a fine edge and thus suitable for training at Sitaler Alpa. Since I was almost at home there anyway, ten days' leave had been added to be taken at the end of the course. A few hours before my departure on 30 May 1944, I handed my Russian rifle and telescopic sight to the regimental armourer. In my hearing he passed it to another young Jaeger, saying, You see all the little notches carved in the stock and handguard? Each is one less Russian. 
To receive this weapon is honour and duty. Do your best, and show Sep on his return that you have been worthy of it. Hearing these heroic words, the young rifleman looked rather embarrassed, and I laid my hand on his shoulder, saying, Don't go mad, just remain on the alert, and keep your head out of sight making the rounds. From a breast pocket I produced a handful of bullets carefully wrapped in a handkerchief, my little stock reserved for special cases, and, pressing them into his hand, said, I probably won't be needing these any more. They are explosive rounds, so go easy with them. The supply is limited to what we can steal from the Russians. Keep on the armourer's good side, and he will keep his eye open for captured ammunition, and put it to one side for you. Tell me in six weeks how you got on. The engine of the Opal Blitz lorry roared up impatiently, and I hoisted myself over the tailboard, the last of eleven leave-takers to board. When I shook the hand of my replacement in parting, an indefinable presentiment of his death made me shiver. The thought came to me suddenly. Poor devil, he isn't long for this world. Are you ladies through with your fond farewells yet? The driver bawled from his cab, and without waiting for an answer, stepped on the gas pedal. Our comrades disappeared behind a thick cloud of dust and exhaust fumes. A feeling of light-heartedness swept over me at my temporary release from the war, but it was tempered by bad conscience at leaving my friends in the lurch. The past year had blotted out my former existence, and the daily struggle to survive had become my only reality. It took a few days to realise for sure that the war had turned its back on me. The peaceful landscapes through which the train puffed its way on the five-day run to Judenburg seemed like an anachronism. When I alighted at the station, a driver on an errand gave me a lift to the depot in his Kubelwagen. I viewed the course with mixed feelings, for my recollections of basic training, with its endless shouting and purposeless drill, were not my fondest memories of the German army. I had only agreed to accept the course because it offered a couple of weeks of proper nutrition regular sleep and the chance of a few days' leave with my family. Therefore I was all the more surprised to receive an almost cordial welcome from the CSM in his office, no standing stiffly to attention, no heel-clicking, just a friendly introductory talk about the course and accommodation. It was clear that this was an advanced course for specialists, and not the brutal indoctrination of course material by rote. The army depot occupied a large area of terrain, the sniper school nestled in a remote barrack complex. I shared a hut with four eighteen-year-olds from Mittenwald, who were fresh from basic training at Kufstein and had been sent from there directly to sniper school, having impressed instructors with their stoical calm and outstanding faculty of observation. My glance fell at once upon a text in Gothic lettering nailed to a wall. The sniper is the hunter among soldiers. His job is difficult and demands the dedication of body, soul and mind. Only a thoroughly convinced and steadfast soldier can become a sniper. It is only possible to destroy an enemy if one has learnt to hate and persecute him with all the strength in one's soul. A sniper is a man set apart from the common soldier. He fights unseen. His strength is based on Red Indian-like use of territory, linked to perfect camouflage, cat-like agility, and masterly use of his rifle. Awareness of his abilities gives him the sureness and superiority which guarantee success. These heroic words did not leave me unimpressed, and I felt a certain pride rise within me. Yet at the same time I remembered the reality of war and its merciless nature. As you die, I thought, all these fine words mean nothing. Next day, Monday, 5th June, 1944. The course entitled Schaffschützen Ausbildung Kompanie WK. 18 began with instruction on rifles with telescopic sights. Our instructor was a sergeant minus a leg, and nearly all the staff were experienced campaigners with partial invalidity. Many were former snipers who had worked out the field craft for themselves at the front until their wounds deprived them of their fit-for-the-front category. The course had sixty trainees, divided into twelve groups of five each, each group having its own instructor to guarantee the almost personal transmission of knowledge. A tabletop was laid with four rifles, three Mauser K-98K 
and a weapon new to us, each fitted with an optical sight. At the front I had heard rumours of a new semi-automatic, but had never seen one. This was the Walther self-loading Model 43 with a Voigtlander, Model 4 sight. The Mausers were fitted respectively with the 15cm long Model 41, the 6-power Zeiss Zielsex, and the Hensoldt Model Dialitan. After an explanation from the tutors regarding the efficiency of the four optics and mountings, they spoke about the Mauser carbine with Hensoldt sight specifically, this being considered the best and firmest combination, and the rifle with which each of us would be issued. In the afternoon we range-tested each of the four rifles. I was amazed at the wide field of vision, the brilliance of the Zeiss and Hensoldt optics, which were far superior to my Russian scope. On the other hand, the latter and the Voigt lander were virtually similar, and although the Walther self-loading rifle was a pleasant weapon to fire, since part of the recoil force was absorbed by the automatic reload mechanism, its accuracy fell short of the Mauser carbine. For amusement, we fired the semi-automatic fitted with the ZF-41 sight, and agreed with the tutors that its designers must have made it as a practical joke. After these free exercises, we returned to ordinary rifle shooting with the conventional K98K carbine over open sights from 50 to 300 metres, freestanding, kneeling, lying. Ammunition was freely available, and the usual safety drills were dispensed with to allow us to keep up the momentum. Next morning found us in the countryside for distance estimation exercises and the tactical assessment of terrain, the afternoon we spent shooting, and in fact there was almost no day in which shooting was absent from the timetable. During the week we were taught trench digging and camouflage. I learnt nothing new and went through the motions. Some of the camouflage ideas were very costly in time and materials, and of questionable value in practice. Hollowed out tree trunks, a full body camouflage of tree bark, a fake milestone of wood to hide a slit trench. These were ideas that seemed to have no practical value. In my experience, camouflage needed to be quickly prepared, effective and improvised from the simplest materials available, limiting the sniper as little as possible in movement. On the last day of the first week we were introduced to the shooting garden. About 50 metres from the firing stands was a miniature landscape designed to resemble a valley with roads and a village reduced to scale. Three small calibre army sports rifles were provided, the Walter Deutsches Sport model with four-power Eugi sight, the Men's Deutsche Sport and the Gustloff Wehrsportgewehr, the latter two both fitted with the Zer 41 optic. The exercise was to keep the landscape under observation and shoot at small papier-mâché figures as soon as they appeared at windows, between houses or behind trees. Tiny cars and horse-drawn carts moving across the landscape were also to be brought under fire, as the situation demanded. In this exercise my practical experience came to the fore. My trained eye picked out the slightest movement and it was rarely more than 30 seconds before my shot hit the target. I used only the Oigi sight. The Z41 had an optic of small diameter and such a poor field of fire that all trainees without exception rejected it as useless for sniper work. I obtained a perfect score in the exercise. The course tutors knew that I had some sniper experience but did not know the extent. A perfect score was so rare that they already suspected there was little more they could teach me. The shooting garden received frequent visits from use throughout the Corsi. The arrangement of scenery and location of targets was changed regularly. To encourage competition between the candidates, our daily scores were recorded and the eventual winner received the reward of a certificate and a large sack of groceries. We were required to keep a small personal notebook to list our scores and jot down observations on the terrain. On the battlefield, it was supposed to serve to note our witnessed kills as well. My roommates advised me to always use code and omit my name as owner, and most important of all to lodge my claimed kills on an anonymous sheet with the CSM, the purpose being to avoid me being identified as a sniper if captured. Any German soldier who fell into Russian hands and was identified as a sniper could expect to be tortured to death. I saw some of the younger trainees blanch when they were told this. Monday of the second week was a red-letter day. 
That morning, a lorry arrived from Mauser, and we helped unload a number of crates stenciled by F. They contained brand new K98K carbines fitted with the four-power Hensolt sight on an adjustable mounting. Each man received a personal issue, its registration number being entered into our individual course books. It would become our personal property upon passing the course successfully. The younger soldiers without battlefield experience were very keen to qualify for this very reason. On inspection I found the weapon to be quite a lot shorter than the Russian rifle I had been using, but the optic was far better. I could hardly wait to test the weapon that afternoon, and after the first few rounds I concluded that this was the sniper weapon which led the field. Our first issue of sniper ammunition was distributed from boxes bearing the designation Anschuss, to distinguish them from ordinary rounds. The instructor explained that the projectiles had been prepared individually to ensure maximum precision. When at the front, we were to ask our armourers for them specifically. We calibrated the optical sight over a distance of 100 metres. This was done by removing the breech and placing the carbine on sandbags on the range table for stability. When the centre of the target was lined up through the barrel, the rifleman coincided the optic by adjusting two screws on the rear foot of the mounting using a special key. After this rough calibration, fine adjustment followed during practical shooting. The day ended with instructions never to allow the weapon out of one's hands, and throughout the remainder of the course the trainees always carried the weapon with them. All rooms had a rifle keep for use at night. The idea was to instill in us the need to protect the optic, for any hard jolt could spoil the calibration. I had learnt this the hard way during my first few days as a sniper at the front, and it now came as second nature, but the other trainees had difficulty handling the carbine with kid gloves. Since the calibration procedure had to be repeated if the weapon was knocked or dropped, the culprit was punished with twenty push-ups and thirty knee bends holding the rifle above his head. The following day we were shown a film entitled Choice Of, and constructing positions. We were astonished to find that it was in Russian, with German subtitles, and had been recorded in 1935. It gave an impressive insight into the high standard of Russian training. The instructor told us how difficult Russian snipers had made the advance of German forces in 1941-1942. Compared to them, we had known nothing. Our losses among command staff from snipers had been devastating. If a unit lacked heavy infantry weapons, a Russian sniper company could pin it down all day. We had tried to get back on level terms using captured optics. On a personal note, he remarked that on his last day at the front he had personally escaped death by a whisker. Tilting his head, a little to one side, to enable us all to see the scar tissue on the left side of his face, from which his glass eye stared, he explained that a sniper's bullet had struck his Zeiss binoculars and saved his life. Even as professionals, make no mistake about it, he warned, and if you notice that your opposite number is gunning for you, clear out and never fire a second shot from the same position. The film held nothing new for me, and I had begun to doze in the darkness, eyes half open, when a scene aroused my interest. It showed a Russian sniper company climbing to the treetops at the edge of a wood. The subtitles read, Treetops with plenty of leaf are an outstanding position. The rifleman cannot be seen, but has a good view of the landscape and an outstanding field of fire. These film sessions were informal, and we were at liberty to interject at any time. The instructor would then stop the projector to allow a point to be made. Indicating that I wanted to speak, the film was stopped and I recounted my tale about the female sniper company at Bakalov. After I had finished speaking, the instructor broke the silence and said, Listen closely, Junger. The Yaga knows what he is talking about. He has already spent a year at the front. Get it into your heads that you make a mistake only once, and in ninety percent of cases you have shit your last. So note well everything you hear on this course, that something may well save your ass in the field. To be on the course... Eating and sleeping regularly, and not in constant fear for my life, was a delight. My thoughts often strayed to 3rd GD, but the censored newspaper reports gave no clear picture. Occasionally the instructors passed on information gleaned from leave-takers, 
and from this it appeared that the sector was quiet and the line had held. Field theory was put into practice over the next few days to test the independence of the individual. We were lodged in a common shelter and had to select a suitable spot to dig a personal slit trench for occupation early next morning. The battle scenario was that two enemy snipers had no man's land pinned down. Any observed movement of the trainee meant his end, the purpose being to teach him to lie low and consider personal strategy for the next day. Near each sniper was a tutor who refereed on claimed kills. The trainees were therefore confined to their individual trenches until night fell. Horror showed itself on almost every face. The value of the exercise was obvious to me, of course. To remain more or less immobile in one spot from five in the morning to eleven at night brought with it questions about food, water and the natural functions. As a veteran, I chose and prepared a position that took all this into account. My comrades preferred for the most part to cover their helmets with a light camouflage of grass and fresh twigs. The day of the ordeal was baking hot. By noon the trainees were bathed in sweat. Their limbs ached and bodily functions needed to be exercised and could not be. Early on I had got a look at the terrain and spotted where the instructors were positioned. From then on it was a piece of cake. I had prepared my slit trench sufficiently deep that I could lay well below the surface. In the field this provided not only good protection against shell splinters, but enabled me to spend long periods of inactivity in relative comfort. A small drainage hole for urinating was reached by a turn to one side. I had trained my body to evacuate early morning, and the problem of solid waste did not arise. As a veteran at the front, it was routine to carry a small supply of water and dry tack. At C. Taylor Alpi, I simply made myself comfortable and spent the day sleeping and chewing biscuit and black bread. When darkness fell and the order came to return to barracks, I found many of my comrades at their last gasp. Most had wet their trousers and worse, attracting the peaty observation of the Corsi Tutor. Men, here's a hot tip. First thing up on rissing, empty your bowels, or words to that effect. Next day, during the official tour of the trenches, I was asked to give the points for and against my own dugout. The course was approaching its end, and many were uneasy at the imminent prospect of spending the remainder of the war in the thick of the fighting at the front. They received a further foretaste during instruction in ammunition. Snipers often moved in no man's land between the lines. If spotted by the enemy, they would be engaged with heavy infantry weapons. In order to judge the correct defensive method, it was an advantage to recognise these weapons by the noise they made when fired. If one came under mortar attack, for example, it was only a question of time before the Russians got the range or saturated the area so thoroughly that one could not avoid falling victim. In this case it was essential to leave the trench at once. If one could not retire through cover, the alternative was to jump up suddenly and run in wild zigzags for the German lines. As previously stated, snipers called this the Hasensprung, the hare's jump. It required a high degree of composure, but offered the only possibility of surviving the situation. Hare's leap was therefore practised repeatedly in training, yet when the hour came, many snipers preferred to remain in their foxholes in a blue funk and perished. While a real mortar could be fired for our instruction, a gramophone record was played for the acoustic demonstration of one of the most feared Soviet weapons, the Stalin organ a multiple rocket launcher mounted on a lorry. The full battery would transform a football field into a blizzard of steel splinters and worked earth. The rhythmic howling noise of discharge played at full volume made the stomach turn. When my co-trainees asked me what was the best defence, I replied, find the deepest hole possible and pray. To round off, a new kind of infantry ammunition was shown. This was known as the B-Patrone, B-Bullet, B standing for Beobachtung, or observation. It had been developed originally as a tracer round for calibrating fighter weapons. The round exploded on impact and indicated the accuracy of the burst. Aerial MG gunners were able to calibrate their weapons relatively quickly using this optical aid. The ammunition was very expensive, however, and its use limited to the purpose for which it was designed. 
The Russians, on the other hand, had issued it to their troops from the onset of the Barbarossa campaign. It was much feared by the German infantry because of the terrible wounds it inflicted. Russian snipers were particularly keen on it. I had already had experience of explosive bullets, and to the extent that the enemy had no compunction in putting it into general use, I considered it justifiable that German snipers should receive the issue. The munition used in small arms was illegal under the Geneva Convention, but the Russians had obviously waived the right to object, and the war was at such a desperate stage for ourselves, having regard to the type of people we faced in the East, that the end practically justified any means. During a short demonstration with these bullets, trees five centimetre in diameter were felled without difficulty. During the last two weeks of instruction, the course concentrated more on the practical. Besides the daily visits to the firing range and the shooting garden, we concentrated on movement in the field, passing unseen through military exercises held by other units or infiltrating between the lines. Later, the principle of the shooting garden was transferred to open terrain and a time limit imposed for spotting and shooting at the papier mache figures. For failure, points were deducted from the scorecard and death awarded. My inexperienced colleagues quickly came to understand the dangers of the life they had embraced. When these drills began, they died like flies, and I was not a stranger to error myself. Yet it was not quite so bad as it looked, for official sniper tactics were permanently offensive, while in reality, on the battlefield, many difficult situations resolved themselves by a healthy dose of caution. A good sniper had to know when it was best to vanish, but the training programme did not teach discretion.